Hello, welcome. We're so glad to see you. We are here with a great group of women um, to talk about empowering women and women of color through diversity, equity, inclusion, and storytelling. Um, the goal of this, uh, this piece is to talk about women and entrepreneurship through the lens of storytelling. Um, we're gonna share how Five, a documentary film short series about the perseverance and passion of female entrepreneurs is engaging new entrepreneurs and changing culture. Um, so my name is Dr. Yelda T. Ools. Um, I'm a former film, film executive um, from major studios like MGM and Sony and turned academic. I got a PhD in child development through UCLA and I founded the Center for Scholars and Storytellers, um, which is based at UCLA to try to work, bring together scholars and storytellers to talk about ways that we can um, and harness the power of entertainment media and storytelling so that the next generation can thrive and grow. So I'm very excited about this group of women um, and I'm going to introduce each of them and then we'll have a little group discussion. So first I wanna start with Monica Biagiotti <laughs> and um, from MasterCard, who is the reason this all started. So I'd love to um, hear more about you and what excited you about this project. Well, thank you so much, Yalda. Very exciting to be with you and with Sarah and Ekta today. So, you know, this project started really from the idea that we wanted to shed a light on uh, women small businesses, women entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, there were different opportunities, right? Uh, on, at Massacre, we are very kind of really passionate about women and gender balance because, you know, women represent, first of all, half of the world. But also, we know that they represent 80%. They have an impact on 80% of purchase decision. So they are really important to us. And, uh, and so we, we were looking into several opportunities on how we could create awareness about, you know, women's small businesses. And, um, and we realized that the most powerful way to do it is, was, you know, instead of going through traditional advertising, which we know is kind of being very, very challenging during the last, you know, years, because on digital, you know, is more and more people are putting 80 blockers. There are thousands of messages entering into the people's lives, right? And so, you know, people are putting filters, right? And they don't really pay any more attention to advertising. So we thought that, you know, going through cinema and, uh, and documentaries was going to be very powerful because it was a great way to create role models, really to talk about role models, to inspire other women, you know, to, to start a business and to kind of really you know, give also a platform, you know, of these five amazing women that we have kind of really described have been protagonists of our five documentaries. Uh, these five women represent the five continents. Um, they are coming from very, very different businesses, you know, from farming to luxury, to, uh, to uh, food, to, uh, to education, and to, you know, there is also a headhunter. So very, very different kind of businesses. Uh, and they have all been very successful in their business. And, but they have one thing in common, all of them beyond being successful, is that they have always tried to kind of bring a positive impact on their community. And you know, our idea was really to shed a light on women who are kind of combining purpose and profit, right? And purpose and business. And so we find these five women, which are amazing, and with amazing story, they went through many, many challenges to be successful in their business. They help their community. And in one way, they not only are inspiring, you know, uh, women in businesses or future students, right? Students who want to kind of really enter into and start a business, but also they're inspiring companies and corporations like us and employees in, in our company. So it was not only a way to kind of really inspire, you know, external people, but also our internal employees. That's amazing. And congratulations. I've, I've heard that you just won an award or were nominated for an award um, on social good from Synopsys. Um, so it's exciting to see that, that the content that you created is being recognized for its impact. 
Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to um, ask the, each of you to actually now tell me about yourself, and then we'll go a little bit more into your businesses. So just introduce yourself. Um, let's start with you, Sarah. Um, tell me about yourself and who you are, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, your business. Okay, my name is Sarah Baidoun. I'm born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I've started my business uh, like 22 years ago. It really started from uh, a small idea and uh, it grew. Uh, I'm a mother of two kids. I have a son who's 19 who has autism and another son who's 16. And um, I live in Lebanon, which is challenging by itself for the time being. Wonderful. Thank you for um, telling me about yourself. And how about you, um, Ekta? Uh, hi, I'm Ekta Jaju, and uh, I'm from India. I run uh, Organic Foods, which is a social enterprise that works with uh, smallholder farmers, um, helps them convert to organic farming, and then we find markets for their produce. Um, prior to uh, Organic, uh, I was a filmmaker myself. And uh, so um, it, it was the first time that I was on the other side of the camera, but it was a very exciting experience. And yes, I absolutely loved uh, the work that all the other women are also doing in this film and really excited to be over here. Okay, well, let's let's talk a little bit more about, um, you know, this, how are you building community, Monica? How are you creating um, with this, this program? Are you creating community? Ekta just mentioned that she, um, loved meeting the other women. How is MasterCard? You, you told us a little bit about how the program was inspired and it's, you know, and I love purpose driven business. Um, that's, I believe that businesses um, can be inspired to do good in the world. Um, and as long as you make it align with their business interests. Um, exactly. So how are you creating community and building on this? So the, the community, we have, we have built a community around women's small businesses because this is one of the key priorities of MasterCard. We made a commitment of you know, reaching 25 million small uh, business, women's small businesses and to support them to grow their business in, in the next five, in the, let's say from 20 to 25. So the commitment was taken in 2020. Now we are not halfway, but close to halfway to it. And so the idea is really to kind of really create a community of women's small businesses through mentorship program, networking opportunities, also providing them digital tools uh, uh, really to scale very digital kind of really business, right? Because we know that digital now also because of the pandemic became so essential really for, for, for many businesses to really, you know, develop and continue to go on, right? And uh, and then this was a way, and when we talk about, you know, these documentaries, you know, we have created a lot of, of course, a lot of panels. We have uh, had, you know, many kind of meetings, you know, both internally with our, you know, internal colleagues at MasterCard. We did several, you know, employee engagement events, but also we participated to festivals. We uh, organized panels with other universities. And so we are kind of creating, you know, a community uh, out of it. And we are keeping also the, the conversation, you know, with all of them. I love it because, you know, by creating these stories and, and sharing it with people around the world and young people, you are inspiring them, I'm sure, and yes. hope it, helping them see that perhaps they could um, do something like that. Yes. I'm a female entrepreneur too, so. Exactly. Um, and, you know, uh, female entrepreneurs have a very particular way to, to lead, to deal with their business. And I think it's really interesting because they do it differently than from men. I think they have a caring, uh, you know, attitude and how they build relationship, which is very specific. And I think it, I think they represent a bit the future, right? Today, only 33% of businesses, small businesses are led by women, owned by women. Is so there is really? really, you know, an opportunity to close the gap, only 33%, yeah. you know, and, uh, and so this is really a clear opportunity to kind of really support women in small business. And we also know that uh, women's small business, you know, hire also other women. We have examples from Sarah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so we know that these, you know, women's small businesses can really create a virtuous effect on, 
on women empowerment and um, but also on uh, on women you know on, on on women empowerment also at work right and having more women working we know that in many countries in the world still a lot of women do not work mm -hmm. so i think that women small business can really have a positive impact in that sense is it different between america and other countries in terms of percentage of women that work or have started their own companies uh, yes it's very it, it changed a lot from country to country and, and some countries you know you could expect that some countries so just to give an example the data in italy so the average globally is 33 percent in italy is only 22 percent you would not expect that but in countries from Vietnam, for example, the percentage is much higher. So I don't know what is the percentage in Lebanon or in, uh, in India. Uh, so not necessarily it's kind of, it's representative of, uh, of our businesses or our corporation. It's really kind of a cultural, cultural thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I know that also in like Mexico, for example, there are also businesses, you know, storefront, basically you're selling goods out of your house and that's yes. a business, but maybe they're not even recognized as businesses as well. Yes. So, um, well, Sarah, I'd love to hear more about Sarah's bag. Um, you got the idea from your thesis. Can you tell me more about that and how the research, which, you know, as a researcher, former storyteller, I'm really interested in that, led you directly to execution. Um, okay. And let us yeah. know about the challenges and how MasterCard helped. Um, tell us everything. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I'm the founder and creative director of Sarah's Bag. It's a company that creates handmade handbags and accessories. But what's special about what we do is that the handwork on these accessories are produced by underprivileged women. We work with women in prison. We train them and we uh, supply them with raw material and we pay them per piece. And we also work with women in remote villages. Uh, so it all started, I was doing my ma master's in sociology and I volunteered in an NGO that rehabilitates women at risk. So I spent there like six months with these women, uh, uh, learning, about, listening to their stories, listening to the stories of abuse, broken families, poverty and so on. So this is when I decided to maybe I could do something and help these women. And uh, I was given a permit to enter the prison. Uh, with this NGO and to work, like to create work there. And uh, this is when I started thinking maybe I do accessories, the bracelet did not work. I tried to do bracelets. And then all of a sudden I had this idea of actually having them do pieces of handwork, like of embroidery and turning this, these pieces into handbags. And this is how the initial idea started. So I started with a team of around uh, 40 women for the first two months. I had 40 women working with me. And then slowly I started to realize that what I was doing was really, uh, first of all, I was, uh, it was, I was uh, like what you say, doing my full potential. I was, it, it, it's uh, something that was really exciting me. And the women that were working with me were really uh, benefiting. Either they were learning skills that they can employ once they're out of the prison. Uh, embroidery and beading is a very calming procedure. So even in the prison, every, uh, everything went was calmer. There were less uh, um, fights between each other, and they were earning money by doing this. So each girl was is paid by the piece. And I would go there uh, week on a weekly basis to give in work and take the work that has been done. In the first three years, I only worked with women in prison. And then with time, those who are really talented started to go out from, from the prison. So I started to track them and to also continue working with them and to encourage them to work with other women in their villages. So this is how like uh, uh, the, the whole community grew. And from a small business, like I started in the year 2000, I was like barely making 15 bags a month. And then with time, I was able to expand keeping my workforce uh, i was able uh, in 2009 i visited for the first time the i did the i went to paris for the fashion week and exhibited in paris and this is when i started to become more like recognized internationally and then with time things changed but all through uh, my career there were 
three pillars that were very, very important for me. First of all, um, the mission behind what we do, like uh, we're there to empower these women. Uh, we're constantly creating designs to fit uh, their, their kind of skill. Uh, second, uh, what's, what's very important for us is uh, the actual design. I always wanted to be a brand that had a strong design. So if you go on sarasbag.com, you will see how even the, the bags by themselves, even if you don't know the story, you would actually like them or, or you would want to have them. And, um, and uh, so uh, uh, third, third, I also wanted, uh, we wanted also to emphasize on the craft crafts because all uh, my ideas and all the bags uh, that are designed are designed based on craft. And all, all these crafts are crafts from the Middle East uh, like embroidery, beading, uh, sequencing, or crocheting. So, so what we did throughout the work is we reinforced the traditional crafts and made them in a way that people could actually wear them on a daily basis. So we made crafts that were sometimes forgotten, uh, modernized, and uh, accessible to everybody. And these three pillars are very, very important in what I do. As challenges, there were a lot of challenges, especially being in Beirut, like being in Lebanon, we, we had, uh, we always have, uh, um, it's, if it's not an economical crisis, it's, uh, it's war or something like this. So now we're facing one of the hardest economical crisis. And um, MasterCard had a lot, after this film actually, um, uh, by the time the film was aired, we had uh, uh, we had a blast in Beirut in uh, August 2021. So it was really de devastating for us, and uh, uh, and I had uh, all my atelier was uh, shattered. Uh, also, my uh, atelier is the workshop, and also my uh, my shop was uh, was uh, damaged. My house was damaged because uh, the bomb was at a um, like a, a 10 kilometer radius, uh, it affected like the whole city and it was in the city. So it was very challenging for me. So when MasterCard was going to launch the film, uh, they contacted me telling me that they're going to launch the film and asking about how I am. And when I told them that actually what, what was filmed is in the film did not exist anymore because I was really, yes, everything really was, uh, it, was a, it was a really very hard phase. And this is when MasterCard stepped up and, and thought like they need to mention this in the movie. And if you see the movie at the point, they say that um, there was a big blast in Beirut and things changed for us. But what came after it is that we were, we were commissioned by MasterCard to create a special collection for them that we're, they're currently selling now on Amazon. And uh, I think this was a turning point for us because it helped us a lot get back on our feet. It helped us. Um, I, we designed the collection in a way that all the craftspeople that work with me are engaged in the collection. So we had different bags done by different craftspeople and also different technique of hand embroidery done by different people. So it was a way for us to regain, uh, regain our life, our work and to continue working because it was the first push for us. And um, it was really empowering for us, especially after uh, the blast. Oh gosh, yeah. We read about that obviously here. It was a huge, um huge disaster. And yeah. to hear your story, how something like that really directly impacted your work and how MasterCard helped you is, is really, it touches you and it brings it home. Um, so I'm glad. Is everything okay now? Is it, is it, yeah, it's are you back a, on track? Yes. It's been a year and a half after that. Yes, we are back on track. Actually, it took me a while to, uh, to rebuild because I was, uh, there was a, a point where when I went into work and saw everything damaged, I even doubted who I am because, you know, when you're linked to a business for so long and then you see the business all of a sudden crumble in front of you, you, you start asking yourself, who, who are you? And uh, this is Working what happened. Identity. <laughs> yes, exactly. Although I tried and told myself I should be separated from this identity, I could not. I really felt I, I, I was completely... Uh, um, yeah, really affected, but uh, 
But with time, you know, you become more resilient. And also, uh, I work with a lot of women in villages. And imagine even the first few days after the blast, they were the ones who called and asked that they come over and help uh, clean up with us and help us all. And, and even my uh, base of clients, are they've been with the brand for so long, and we're kind of very close to our clients. So they also... Uh, helped a lot either by buying online or by just calling or sending you know everybody who could help in a way send it help and uh, this was a way for us to get back on our feet and to continue um, so that's and, great yes and also in times like these you start feeling that uh, uh, like the mission of empowering women is more important because more women need us now so now we're back full-fledged, full force, and uh, uh, we are an agile company, so we're able to shift. Uh, we're not only doing bags, but we're only also doing some outerwear and some kaftans and some, some clothes. So we're really adapting to, uh, to the market, uh, but I'm really glad that uh, we were accompanied by MasterCard and uh, because, like, really, it was, um, uh, they came at the right time, and I love this film because also when I see the film uh, five, I remember my life before the crisis and before the bomb and before everything. Uh, although now we're back to uh, to normal, but it always feels good to see how we used to live. It before. feels we might need another film, a story of resilience. <laughs> um, well, at Etka, let's let's turn to you. Would love to hear more about um, your business. And you know, I loved how you helped farmers make up their own minds about organic versus not organic. Um, can you tell us about how you're expanding your work to more farmers, and what kind of resources help you get the message out? And hopefully, you don't have as a story as dramatic as Sarah's. <laughs> um, so. Starting with the how do we convince farmers so to be very honest with you. Um, so I personally was very passionate about organic farming and I did feel, I still do feel that, you know, it makes perfect sense for smallholder farmers and uh, it can really um, change things for smallholder farmers in my country. So when we, uh, we were already working with a lot of uh, farmers and, you know, we trained them in organic farming, but it was actually them. So why we may think that, you know, we, while farmers create like the sorry pictures in our mind, uh, the farmers that we worked with were very entrepreneurial. So after they, you know, learned how to, you know, grow food organically, they actually experimented on their fields for a year. So every season they would grow the same crop um, organically and inorganically and test, you know, and uh, at the end of the year, they actually came back saying that uh, we tried, you know, growing this crop organically and guess what it works. And, you know, in some cases, they actually did better than the conventional crops. Also because, you know, we trained them on how to grow and, you know, a lot of other things which they were not following otherwise. So, yeah, they were very happy with the organic farming. They just uh, said that we just need two things. We need someone who will commit to buy what we are growing because, you know, uh, that we don't have markets for organic produce or we don't have buyers for organic produce. So you have to promise that if we grow food organically, it will get sold. And the other, they said that, you know, there is a dip in production. You know, you always say that organic has better markets. So if you can ensure that, you know, we'll get paid better than what we were getting paid before, uh, we are very happy to switch. So, you know, it, it really didn't require much convincing. I mean, it makes sense, right? So, yeah, I think if the economics work for smallholder farmers, then um, they would definitely <coughs> want to switch to organic farming. So uh, uh, from that point onwards to where we are right now, we're really not required uh, too much push to convince farmers to turn organic or stay organic. Um, the idea has just been that what we realize is the single um, largest challenge um, has been lack of markets. So if you're able to create enough markets and sustainable markets for smallholder farmers, um, you're solving this really big problem that helps more farmer to convert to organic or to stay organic. And uh, so that's all that, you know, what really we've been doing is just creating more markets for them. And as we do that, and as the demand for organic grows for us, uh, more and more farmers switch are we able to bring in more and more farmers into our fold. Uh, over the last uh, couple of years, what we've also started to do is we've realized that <clears throat> um, we, can't, we, we don't just need to help farmers uh, who are conventional to switch to organic, but there are also so many smallholder organic farmers who don't have markets. 
So they would either switch to conventional produce or, you know, not get paid well. And so we've also started to identify a lot of these groups who are already organic, but do not have access to markets and see how we can sort of also support them. So that's how we've been scaling up uh, on the back end. Well, storytelling might be able to help you, you know, get get it out to the consumer how organic makes a difference in the food that they consume. Um, Monica, how did you choose the people that you um, ended up filming? And if someone is interested who's watching this program, how is is the program continuing? What what's what are the next steps for this? So, you know, we have been working with several partners, right, to, to really discover this amazing five women. And so I, I, uh, we have kind of created some criteria, right? We were looking for a small business women, successful, so completely sustainable businesses, right, in the sense that, you know, it was not a non-profit business. They had to have this kind of impact, right, positive impact. Uh, they had to come from different geographies and from different businesses. So uh, it has been really gone through, through partners, through friends, through producers, right? It was a, not an easy process. Uh, we really wanted to also kind of really also in one way show, uh, show diversity in our, you know, from in all terms, right? And, uh, and so I think it has been a great, you know, process. So, uh, this is kind of five documentaries. Uh, at the moment, we are not planning to produce others, but uh, uh, for sure we are going to continue to be into the storytelling and into documentaries because uh, we have seen that documentaries and in filming, etc. We, you know, it's really very powerful way. You know, role model is probably the most powerful way to really inspire and educate people, right? Because it does it both on a conscious and unconscious part, right? And, uh, and we know that this is so powerful really for changing people's behavior. And, uh, and also it's a very untraditional way. We are very passionate about cinema. As MasterCard, we sponsor among the biggest you know, film festivals in the world from Cannes to Venice to Berlinale. So this is kind of, you know, a passion that we have since long time. And uh, so this is something we would really like to continue. But at the moment, we really don't have, you know, a, a, a precise plan on that. Well, I love it. It is very true that storytelling um, and, and, you know, it's interesting when you listen to people's origin stories, you know, very many people they often are inspired by a character they read about in a book or something they saw in a film and they that opened their eyes to a world, you know, and especially for women around the world, yes. um, I'm certain that, um, you know. You not, can do what you can see, right? In one way, exactly. right? And, exactly. And, so, uh, and if these amazing women have made it, you know, you can say, okay, I can try to, to yeah. do it. And uh, yeah. When we were kind of showcasing and showing these films, you know, to students or to young women, uh, I can tell you that they're, they're, the audience was very, very excited, you know, and uh, I so love it. This is really exactly why we are doing it, right? Yeah. So this yeah. is exactly the reason yeah. why we are doing it. And and you know, young people that you know in 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 yes. America now, National Academy of Science defines adolescence from ten to twenty five. And that's an age when they're so open and they're so interested and they're excited. So if you can get to them through storytelling, you really can change them. Yes, I believe um, this is very, very effective. So effective. Um, Sarah and Ekta, I'd love you to share one piece of advice for um, starting your own business um, to someone that may be watching this. Uh, so one piece of advice would be actually to start a business with a, that has a social impact. Uh, I think the consumer of today is a consumer that's totally aware of what's happening around and they want to buy something that really impacts um, the community he's living in. So, so having uh, like when I did it 20 years ago, I didn't even know what it was called. I just did it because I felt there was a need and I needed to help, and I felt that I could make a change and make a difference. Um, but nowadays, I think the consumer really wants uh, something that has a very positive impact on the community around him or her. Absolutely, I think um, um, 
I think um, I'll double that. I think what Sarah said is extremely important. And to add to that, uh, what I would say is that uh, uh, whether a social business or uh, not a social business, but whatever you do, make sure you're extremely uh, passionate about it because uh, like Sarah mentioned, there are, there are going to be lots of ups and downs. There are going to be lots of challenges. And if you're not passionate about you know, what you're doing, um, to survive through a crash the way Sarah did and to rebuild and to, you know, get back to life. Um, it takes a lot if you're not passionate and mm -hmm. this is bound to happen. It, you know, it may be as drastic, it may not be as drastic, but there will always be ups and downs. And so to keep going and to, um, you know, be able to survive, that passion is extremely important. So find something that you love to do. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> The advice is always is is I have students that are all concerned about what am I going to do after I graduate? And I said, don't worry about it. Just try things. See what you love. And, you know, it's always us, us women or people from older generations. That's it's the same advice and it's hard for them to follow. But having inspirational people like you say it, I'm I'm sure it will help. Um, so quickly, we're just going to wrap up. I'm just going to ask a fun question. Um, about storytelling and kids, given that that's what we think about at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. Uh, Monica, do you have kids? And if so, what kind of content do they like? And it could be from when they were a kid, what kind of stories, yes. but it could be now too. Yes, so I, I you know, I, I, I checked your question. I called them, right? Because I wanted to make sure that I, I was remembering well. So my daughter, so she she loved when she was a very you know young kid dora explorer mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, she also kind of fully recognized herself identified herself in rapunzel because she also looks like a bit like rapunzel she's a nice she's a light nice looking girl and so she was watching and watching it again right so this is really clear how much you know you need to kind of recognize yourself and identify yourself right with a kind of role, role model, right? And she was kind of really identifying herself in, in Rapunzel. Then she moved to Violetta. <laughs> then, uh, you know, and but now she's kind of really watching classical films, all series on Netflix, you know, as, as old people. She's and uh, my son, <laughs> sorry. She's binging. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. <laughs> Uh, and then my son is more traditional, so it was, he started with Il little Einstein's, you know, mm -hmm. then from, and then there is the whole Japanese word, which I think is so powerful in terms of storytelling and role model, it creates such a kind of strong kind of environment and, uh, you know, for, for boys especially, so Dragon Ball, then he moved to uh, Detective Conan, and now he's all about also all mangas and, uh, and uh, his big hero, of course, is Miyazaki. And uh, so this is a different universe, you know? So I, I would say a bit stereotype, the girls with Rapunzel and the boys with manga, but you know, it is what it is. Well, and as you said, you, you relate to the character. So if, you're, if you identify as female, you're gonna, you probably relate to yes. a female character. And exactly, exactly. But you know, it's true that it shaped a bit their education, you know, and mm -hmm. it's such an important part of their education and the development of their own personalities as well. It really is. Um, Ekta, what about you? Um, I don't have kids. So, um, yeah. So but tell us I about you. Nieces. What were the oh, things you I, watched? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I grew up watching a lot of Indian mythologies um, and some magic shows that would come on Sundays. And um, in my teenage years, I watched a lot of Friends and, you know, a lot of Full House and yeah. Oh a my lot goodness. Of, a, lot, a lot of that. Yeah. A lot of American soaps, but yeah. And how about you, Sarah? Well, uh, I want to tell you something about me is that I, growing up, I was inspired by uh, uh, a, an Egyptian jeweler called Azza Fahmi that I heard had, uh, was working with uh, boys on the street. She, she would recruit uh, boys on the street and she would teach them the craft of doing jewelry. And I was so taken by this. I think it was something that stayed in my unconscious because later on when I worked and 
I met Azza Fahmi and she came to my office and I told her I was so inspired by your work. And she ended up telling me that what I heard of this program is a program she was able to run only for one month and she was not able to continue. But imagine uh, for me, it, it was such a big inspiration, like hearing her story and wanting to do something similar or helping at the same time as working and so on. So it's very, very important to be inspired either by movies or by uh, books or by seeing characters. And But I think really movies and documentaries uh, really could uh, inspire a lot of people. And yeah. it's so important to be inspired. Yeah, well, I'm so glad that all of you were able to join us. And thank you to MasterCard for, for creating these five inspiring stories of um, amazing female entrepreneurs, global entrepreneurs. Um, and if you're interested in watching these, I'm sure there'll be links attached. Um, and we are, uh, thank you all for joining us um, for this day to talk about the perseverance and passion of female entrepreneurs and storytelling. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.